talk to you about um, economic integration and its connection to resentment and extremism. So the defining characteristic of the European welfare states with respect to immigrants is the lack of economic integration. This includes uh, lower employment rates and lower average wages uh, for those who have jobs, typically because uh, the immigrants on average tend to be more likely to work in um, low skill sectors, low paying jobs, and in uh, lo uh, low paying self-employment. So among the European welfare states, there is n really no uh, exception to this, where this graph shows the difference in the employment rate between immigrants and natives. Uh, and the, the gap is the biggest in uh, Sweden where I live, but uh, it's always, it also exists in Belgium, Norway, Denmark. The only really exceptions are the United States and uh, Canada, and also a few of the Southern European countries, such as Italy, who, who have a different type of immigration. Uh, other than that, they, all these countries have gaps, and they have gaps both in employment and typically in wages for uh, people who are employed. Uh, this is the employment of youth in uh, various European welfare states. Again, all of them have this gap. The, the smallest here is the United Kingdom. Switzerland is not on the picture. Switzerland also has a small gap, but again, Switzerland has a different type of immigration. This is comparing natives with non-European immigrants, usually European immigrants from other Nordic countries or other Western European countries. They do roughly as well as the natives, the, the, whereas the gap is, is from third world immigrants. And uh, you also see this economic divide persisting in a second generation. In some countries, such as Sweden, the divide tends to shrink to the second generation, so it goes, maybe half of it goes away. In some countries, such as France, the, the gap tends to grow in the second generation. So the second generation relative uh, to the natives do even worse than their parents do. There we go. So why is this? Well, the fundamental reason, probably, is uh, differences in human capital. So immigration is a process that will destroy, very, very effectively, country-specific human capital. So, you know, we, we grew up in a country, we know the language, we have our social network, we know the customs, we, ha we have the life culture, uh, we have the... Uh, work culture, we have, the, we have an education that's sort of tailored to that country, that can be evaluated in that country. And if any of you would tomorrow, and I'm, I'm sure all of you all here are highly skilled individuals with the good jobs, if you would move to China, you would probably do much worse, at least in the beginning, than you do in your uh, own country. And this is uh, true for almost all immigrants. And what happens typically in immigration is that Human capital is destroyed. There is a shock to human capital. It's nobody's fault. But then immigrants will, in their new country, rebuild human capital, and their incomes will tend to, and their employment rates, will tend to grow faster than the natives. And there is a, per, a period of uh, convergence. And um, in historically in the United States, for example, it will take something like 10 years for the immigrants to reach native levels and sometimes surpass it, perhaps because immigrants would be more motivated or selected among the more entrepreneurial people or something like this. In, even in the United States, this has declined. So uh, you, you no longer, among the low-skilled immigrants, have this uh, rapid convergence. And, you know, we c you can't wait an infinity for convergence because people age and a typical immigrant is in the workforce for 30 years, and then the, it's time for retirement. Uh, the conversion is, of course, or per, maybe not of course, but it's faster for the high-skilled. Now, this is uh, data on Sweden for refugees. Uh, and uh, what you will see is that uh, employment rate will increase, but it increases too slowly to ever catch up on average with the native population. So the employment rate in Sweden among the people with Swedish origin is roughly 85%. That's 
that's the mine the highest in the world, and that is a part rate that is required to fund this generous welfare state. And refugees and their relatives, they typically will, um, it will take up on average 15 years to, to reach 60% employment rate. And after that, it sort of uh, plans out and it never really surpasses 70% before it's time for retirement. And uh, together with this gap in employment, you have a gap in uh, average wages, as, as I said, which combined means that the la average labor market income is something like 40% below natives. And this gap is, in fact, uh, in Sweden larger between natives and non-Western immigrants than the, than the economic divide between African Americans and whites in the United States. Now, of course, the Swedish welfare state compensates, so the poverty gap is not as large, but the market gap is as large. And in Sweden, everybody knows about the economic divide between blacks and whites in the United States, but they're not always that well informed about their own country. And I should also say that in Sweden, as well as most other European countries, this situation has not really changed. So you will find roughly the same relative employment rates 20 years ago than you have now. It's, it's a fairly stable process. Uh, and here you can see that this is true in all ages. This is, again, uh, you're comparing the employment rate. The, the dark blue ones are natives, and the light blue are uh, foreign-born. And by the way, these numbers include European immigrants that tend to do better. Uh, and what, what is also interesting here is to, that among the Swedish native-born population, especially men, you have something reaching full employment. It's not far from it. 90% uh, in the working ages uh, work. Uh, the, uh, so this, the gap between natives and immigrants is uh, particularly strong among, among the low-skilled. And there are m multiple theories why you have this. You can have, you can, people argue it's discrimination, it's cultural factors. Some people say immigrants don't want to work if they have welfare. Uh, it, but if you ask me, I would say that the fundamental explanation is quite simple. It's human capital. And if you control, and that c includes both formal education it includes the quality of education, it includes work experience in that country, and it also includes, uh, and it should be not forgotten, language skills. And as I mentioned earlier, the English-speaking countries consistently perform better. And of course, the important explanation is they have different welfare system, perhaps different culture, different types of migrants, but also that they speak English. And uh, in the Middle East, a lot of people, for example, know in North Africa speak some English. Almost nobody, of course, speaks Norwegian or Swedish. Uh, and what you will find is that if you control for human capital, and the better you control for human capital, the, the more of this uh, gap goes away. So if you control for formal education, that's a crude way to measure. You know, you, you, can, you could argue that uh, the degree from the Mogadishu Institute of Technology is not quite the same thing as MIT. But uh, that still makes the gap go away. And if you control for, uh, you objectively measure knowledge, especially language skills, then you actually get most of the gap goes away and there is no significant difference. And in Sweden, for example, that I'm more familiar with, that there is a fairly large difference between educated people who have degrees from um, the Middle East or North Africa. But there is almost no difference between those who have Swedish degrees from good universities and native-born Swedes. There's a small difference, I should say, even there, but it's, it's, there really goes, most of it goes away. And the same thing for people who are adopted. There is almost no difference between them and the, the native-born Swedes, whereas there, there are vast differences for people for, who are immigrants from those countries. Uh, yeah, so there are studies that, you, that try to estimate the effect of discrimination. And what they, for example, can do is they will send an ident two identical CVs, and in one they will put Mohammed, and in one they will put Sven. And they'll see what, how will employers respond to this. And one study finds that uh, of these CVs, 29% are uh, called back to, to call for a job interview among people who have Swedish names, and 20% among 
people with identical CV that have a, a Middle Eastern name. And that's evidence of labor market discrimination. There are other ev evidence of labor market discrimination. However, we sh uh, economists have a very useful distinction with various types and motivations for labor market discrimination because this is really important, wh what exactly is going on. So one type is, you can call it preference-based or pure discrimination, which is, I don't like you. I don't like the people from your ethnicity, so even if I know you're as productive and qualified, I'm not gonna hire you. The other type is, uh, another type is called statistical discrimination, and that just says, I don't know you, I don't know exactly who you are, I, uh, it's very difficult for me to evaluate you. I do know that people from your origin, on average, tend to be po poorer s Swedish speakers or have less education or something like that. Therefore, if I get two identical CVs, and of course, a CV does not give you all the information about somebody. It gives you some information, but not all of it. I will just make a, what is given uncertainty, a rational decision to assume that if you belong to the lower average group, uh, you, are, you yourself probably are lower average. And I will pick the other one. And this is going to be especially strong. The less information you have, the more uncertainty you have, and um, also the, the more and the higher unemployment, because if you have 100 CVs, they all sort of look identical, which is true today for a lot of low-skilled jobs. Why take a risk for somebody who is uh, lower skilled? And this, of course, is far weaker among the very highly skilled. I have never experienced any discrimination in the labor market because I'm an academic and my output is pretty objective. But I have seen immigrant friends who apply for jobs, and if somebody says there is no discrimination, I would say they're not well informed. And by the way, you see the same in Sweden in the labor, uh, housing market, which is to say tenants prefer not to uh, rent out to, uh, to immigrants. Uh, an important reason for a lack of economic integration, I would argue, is the lack of social integration. So integrating into a society is a social process. You do it by meeting people. You do it, you learn language by talking to people. You learn their subtle culture. And if you talk about the Scandinavian, theirs is a complex culture and tacit, but quite in its own way conservative with many, many un unknown rules, how t loud you talk, how you deal with conflict, Things like that. And of course, people in Scandinavia, as well as any other country, are fish in the water in the sense that they're not aware of these uh, culture codes. They would typically not be able to articulate it because that's just taken for granted. You only really become aware of it if you travel to a very different culture and then you sort of understand your own culture. For example, it's not at all obvious that people are just going to self-organize into a queue in every society in the world, whereas it is obvious in Norway. At any rate, uh, these things you have to be taught. Moreover, uh, a lot of the economy is networks, social networks. You want, if you probably all of you or really many of you have gotten jobs because of somebody you know. And in Sweden, um, and I think this is similar in many other Northern European, Western European countries, you have a high uh, rate of lip service to multiculturalism but the private behavior differs. So in Sweden, you will, have, you will get, if you, if you do a, a poll, something like 80% will say they support multiculturalism, and 80% will say that they themselves rarely or never socialize with uh, non-Western immigrants. Um, and uh, this goes both ways. You know, as they, this in, in turn, immigrants sometimes, is, uh, visible my immigrants, that's a great word the British use, visible immigrants will, will feel not welcome. Because, first of all, there is, a, there is some degree of misunderstanding, which is that your neighbor doesn't say hi to you. Sweden and Norway are the two countries in the world with the highest rate where people do not know the name of their neighbors in, in, when they live in uh, multiple housing. And of course, in the Middle East, that would, that's abnormal. But that's, when people take it wrongly as a... Uh, as a um, negative reaction to themselves, rather than they, they don't understand that it is the culture, the same way that the Scandinavians will misunderstand culture behavior. And so 
you know, why you, I often say that uh, the, there is a paradox in the uh, northern European migration system, which is that the state is quite warm and generous, but uh, the people are not, cold and distant. And immigrants in the Middle East or wherever, they say, well, the Europeans are saying, you know, we're going to give you general asylum, come to our country. They, they often experience a shock or even a trauma when they actually arrive because they discover that people don't seem to want to do, deal with them. They don't want to give them jobs. If they move to their neighborhood, you will have white flight. And uh, if you put you know, if you a lot of immigrants in school, the Swedes will take out their kids. And you know, they've shown that the tipping point in Sweden is 4%. If a neighborhood has 4% non-Western Europeans, the Swedes will start to move away. And if you poll them, they, they, they're, the people who have moved away from multicultural neighborhoods are slightly more likely to say that they like multiculturalism than people who actually stayed behind. Uh, now, I think that it, it's, it's good not, you, sh you shouldn't moralize about any of this. Uh, one interpretation among the conservative right is immigrants are lazy and don't want to work. There is not really any strong evidence for this. Even in welfare states, in Sweden, immigrants who are unemployed are slightly more likely to, to intensely look for work. And yes, it's true that you get welfare payments, but in the long run, people do, even in Scandinavia these days, they have a big income difference if they work and they don't work. It's also because your uh, social benefits are often tied to employment. Um, and, uh, you know, the, I, on, when you try to explain this vast gap that, never, that doesn't shrink, seem to shrink, the, uh, the right will often blame Scandinavian socialism, and the left will often blame Scandinavian racism. But the evidence is weak in both cases. In, in recent years, you have had a lot of uh, experiments of heavy subsidies to hire immigrants, you can get 50 to 80% of the wage subsidized. And that hasn't really created many jobs. That goes against the idea that it's the high taxes and uh, uh, high, high wages that is causing this. And as I mentioned earlier, the fact that the, these differences are so tied to individual attributes also goes against the racism theory, which is if this racism, why are you not discriminating people who have Swedish oh. degrees or are, or are adopted or second generation? Uh, and without moralizing, I think the explanation is pretty simple. It's human capital in a knowledge economy. You know, and you have increasingly the twin force forces of globalization and automatization that is eroding the demand for low and middle skill work. And this has gone on in all Western countries, and it has not only hit immigrants, it has also hit the native population, the low skill population. It's, you, you also have high unemployment rates for Swedes or Norwegians without degrees. The really, the only, there are a few exceptions, Switzerland and Austria, maybe Germany, that have maintained high employment rates. The, other than that, there is no country anymore that has full employment. Not, the United States doesn't have it. Canada, Canada doesn't have it. Um, and by the way, it's interesting. What's really happening is perhaps not that the low-skilled jobs are going away. It's the middle-skilled jobs are going away and they're pushing the people who are middle skilled to take low skilled jobs and push the people who are low skilled jobs entirely out of the labor force. That's to summarize it. At the same time, the demand for high skilled labor has never been higher and the wages have never been higher. Uh, given this, the key solution is to raise productivity. If you, can, if you don't raise the productivity, you can't get away, you can't force employers to hire. And by the way, you probably, if the explanation for discrimination is statistical, there is no way you can do anything about it without changing the group attributes. And one example is, anecdotally, that when I came to Sweden in the late 80s, Swedes had roughly the same, let's say, prejudice against Iranians that they would have against uh, Arabs or Iraqis. But uh, over time, the Iranian population, that is the, probably the most well-educated immigrant group, is the only immigrant group where the second generation has more uh, schooling than Swedes. The Iranians have sort of gotten a, a better reputation, anecdotally, than Iraqis, who are still are, have low rates of employment. And the reason is not that the Swedes can see the difference. I can't see the difference between an Iranian and an Iraqi. 
it's that uh, they have, by experience, come to see that the group average differs. So they don't statistically discriminate Iranians the way they, would, they still statistically discriminate Arabs. Um, again, I don't see any point moralizing about this. That what you have to do is you have to change the group average so that it's not true anymore, the prejudice. It shouldn't be statistically true either. Of course, you can always say that you should have a norm that people, because this is a painful for a afflicted, you should perhaps sort of have a norm to err on the side of obtaining more information. You know, that, that perhaps we, we have such norms, but uh, there is only so much in a decentralized market economy you can expect. And by the way, this is true for government employers as well. They, they behave the same way. Um, so I also want to talk about the poisonous interaction between in, in economic inequality and race. And I think that Mr. Bundewick uh, mentioned this before about uh, the importance of feeling humiliated uh, uh, for, for driving resentment, which is that if you have economic gaps between uh, blue-eyed Scandinavians, that is more or less random, or, or you know, it's not very systematic, that's one thing. People can perhaps say, well, I'm unemployed, but that's just because I didn't work hard, or I'm an alcoholic, or something like that. But if you grew up in a country, or you were even born there, and you're low-skilled, and uh, you go to bad schools, you speak Swedish or Norwegian or Finnish or Danish with an accent, and then you notice that people who look different are, uh, tend to do better, it's very easy to conclude that this is racial discrimination or intolerance. And of course that creates fury and resentment. Um, and there is, at the same time, while there is some truth to that, it's important to understand the mechanisms for both sides. Because the, the myth that you have uh, along, among uh, the left and uh, the politics, which is that there is going on some sort of general structural discrimination that people are completely powerless against and doesn't not have nothing to do with you. That's not true, first of all. That's empirically not true. And second of all, it's a very dangerous idea because it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And psychological research shows these ideas of locus of control. If you think you're powerless and your actions don't, don't influence your fate, you're much less likely to succeed. And this myth also means that people don't know the path to integration. And the path, I mean, I give the advice, and that's what I followed. Well, if Swedes and Scandinavians only respect skill, then obtain skill. Go to a good university. Then they're not going to discriminate you. Um, and at also, I'm going to finish now, is that um, when you have you, what, what the Europeans need to deal with the immigrants, I would argue, aside from reform of labor market and not the least education system, is a new social contract. Because not having any demands is, a, is sort of a soft bigotry. Swedes and uh, other, other Europeans will, will uh, have high demands on, the, on the, each other. But, and their social contract is if you, you, do, you, you do your best and you're part of society and even if you fail, we're going to take care of you. But if, if they sort of, without acknowledging it perhaps, view, don't expect anything from immigrants, there is no path to bec fully becoming part of society. You cannot become part of nothingness. If there, and you know, saying there is no Swedish culture, or there is, it's just a physical location with people having contact with each other, that's first of all not true, and second of all, that's not a path to integration. The path should be, we, de we demand A, B, C from you. We demand loyalty, and you get a degree, and you don't commit crime. But if you fulfill this, then as a reward, we are going to treat you as one of our own. And as long as you don't do that, and you either deny the mechanism, you deny and perhaps don't understand, and, uh, mis or misdirect, there is not going to be, uh, be uh, economic integration. Thank you.